The Climate Action Reserve is the most experienced and trusted offset registry to serve the carbon markets. As more organizations look to combat climate change and support environmental projects with true integrity, they turn to the reserve to foster real solutions and reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. We are excited to kick off the second series of Carbon Connection and feature external partners with insights and expertise in particular climate sectors and topics across the carbon market. I am your host, Lauren Napuk, and thank you for joining us. Hi, welcome to our next episode of Carbon Connection. Today is a special episode as we are closing out our second series and round of interviews with our very own president at the Climate Action Reserve, Craig Ebert. Craig oversees our organization's continued leadership and commitment to ensuring offsets are a trusted and powerful economic tool for reducing emissions. Today, I'm delighted to speak with Craig about international initiatives that are underway to address integrity and scale in the voluntary carbon market and how the reserve continues to support these efforts through our high quality accounting and carbon market standards. Craig, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lauren. Delighted to be here. Craig, just to jump into things, we know that integrity initiatives for the voluntary carbon market have actually been in the works for a while. So could you tell us a little bit about where these initiatives are today and what role is the Climate Action Reserve playing in each of these initiatives? Absolutely. There have been a number of critical developments in the voluntary carbon market, what I'll often call a VCM. And, and maybe to wind the clock back a bit, just to re- remind everyone, a few years back, we suddenly started seeing a lot more interest from the private sector, from potential buyers in particular, investing in, in carbon credits. And I think people quickly came to a resolution that there was a fundamental supply demand imbalance in the uh, global voluntary carbon market. Frankly, that should not have been a surprise. Each of us working as a registry has our own stakeholders that we're working with, and we have been working to to meet that level of demand. However, when the world suddenly started to pay a lot more attention to the functioning of the voluntary carbon market, you know, they looked around and realized that in aggregate, when you looked at the potential demands that the private sector will have on the BCM, there simply wasn't enough supply. Frankly, that shouldn't be a big surprise. There's not a single market on the planet that responds overnight to uh, massive increases in demand. And that's what we've been seeing. But having said that, one of the, the takeaways from that has been the, the need to elevate the perceived integrity in the VCM. And there were a bit of variety of efforts. Uh, a few years back, there was an effort called the Task Force for Scaling the Voluntary Carbon Market which was the precursor to what is currently called the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market. And the ICBCM has taken over the mantle of defining for the global market exactly what constitutes high quality, what constitutes high integrity in the VCM. And that's been a, a very welcome development. But the ICBCM has been primarily focusing on the supply side, that those of us like the Climate Action Reserve that are bringing high quality credits to market. There's been a companion effort called the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative or the VCMI that has worked on defining the rules for the buyers in the market. Think of it as more on the demand side, specifically around what claims companies can make when they're investing in carbon credits and more broadly just investing in their climate mitigation strategies what steps they need to take to make various types of claims. And so that's what the VCMI has been doing. Those have been the two primary efforts. There's been another effort that has garnered a lot of attention and support to many companies, the Science-Based Target Initiative. Last time I checked, there were over 6,100 companies that had signed on to SBTI, and they've been definitely getting a lot of traction. Uh, One other effort I'll just mention for now is the Climate Action Data Trust. That is an effort that was originally started by the World Bank, and it's now originally called the Climate Warehouse. It's now developed into the Climate Action Data Trust that is housed in Singapore. And it's intended to be essentially a, a clearinghouse for carbon credit information across the planet. 
just to make sure that we can minimize any concerns around double issuance or double counting of credit. So it's another effort designed to bolster the overall integrity of the market. Now, from the Climate Action Reserves perspective, we've been involved in most of these efforts at some level. Matter of fact, our Vice President of Programs, Christy Gorgonpour, is co-chair of the Technical Committee for the CAD Trust. I've been serving on different work groups with the predecessor task force for the BCM and now the ICBCM, currently participating in what's called the Categories Working Group to advance what they call core carbon principles, both for specific credits as well for programs to ensure that they had the right procedures for ensuring a high level of integrity. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, the reserve submitted our application to the ICBCM for accreditation. We know that we've been bringing the highest quality credits to market. That's our intention uh, longer term, you know, for many, many years into the future, we'll continue to do that. And it's important to be part of that process to decide how the BCM is going to be structured to ensure that we're addressing integrity in the right way. Thank you so much, Craig. That was such a fantastic summary as you've walked us through all of these different initiatives that are taking charge across the market, as well as highlighting the critical role that the reserve is playing, you know, touching on Kristen even being involved in the CAD Trust, as well as you participating in these conversations, I think is really important to share. And as we have been seeing the growth and expansion of these initiatives, we've also been seeing that the VCM has been receiving some criticism lately. So I'm wondering if you can share with us how these criticisms can be addressed. Absolutely. There's, first of all, there is no question that the VCM has been under assault recently. That shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone unless you've been living under a rock. But I would like to, to divide my answer up into a real versus perceived problem. And I don't mean to underestimate the real problems. Part of the reason the VCM has been receiving criticism is it's justified in some cases. There have been credits that have been issued that are dubious value in terms of additional incremental high quality actions to address the climate crisis. And they cut across the board in a number of different categories, but particularly for what's called red plus activities, jurisdictional red, essentially broad brush attempts to protect, for example, remaining swaths of the Amazonian rainforest. There's also been questions raised about credits offered for large hydro projects as one example, or even for many types of energy projects. Now that renewables have often gotten cost effective, there are some parties that claim that none of those types of activities should or should not be receiving credit. Generally, those activities that the reserve has not, hasn't been involved in. But I do want to re remind folks that while some of these credits may have come up short, they've come up short for all the right reasons. Folks have been trying to stop Amazonian deforestation, for example, and it's important that we get it right. The BCM is constantly subject to a continuous improvement process, and yet there are some people that perceive that they'll never achieve that quality standard. That is simply nonsense. That goes to the other part of my answer about the perception that there's a lack of quality there. The fact of the matter is we know how to estimate greenhouse gas emissions beyond the fence line of the company's operations. We know how to estimate it within the fence line. By in the fence line, I mean any company that's directly burning coal, oil, or natural gas. The fact that we can measure those should give a lot of comfort to everyone that we can also devise appropriate methodologies for quantifying mitigation activities that will reduce those emissions. There's nothing mysterious about that. Doesn't mean we don't have to bring more quality to market. We do, hence the work of the ICBCF. But at the end of the day, the climate crisis demands that we get it right. It demands that the BCM play a critical role and we can bring those high quality credits to market. So there's one other aspect of the criticisms and I'm fond of calling them chicken little critics. And they really are letting perfection be the enemy of the good. What do I mean by that? Part of the problem is that there are some individuals, some organizations and companies who simply do not want reliance on market-based solutions to address the climate crisis. They for whatever reasons, they don't trust it or what have you. So they don't want to see a reliance on market-based solutions to address this problem. I think reliance on market-based solutions is fundamentally critical to solving this crisis. Matter of fact, it's an argument to be made that 
we won't find a solution without vigorous involvement from companies. And that's really what we need to bolster. It doesn't mean that every credit out there at the moment is of sufficient quality. And just again, highlight the work of the ICBCM. They have come out and defined these core carbon principles. They are going to be assessing overall programs on how well they comply with those core carbon principles or CCPs. And they're going to be looking at individual credits and credit types to see whether they're deserving of that, the highest quality label. So that type of effort is designed to instill more confidence in the market. And those of us who had been in the markets for a while realize that we need that benchmark high quality performance in order to send that message to buyers that indeed investing in Kylie credits makes a whole lot of sense. As a matter of fact, it may be the most critical investment that can be made to address the climate crisis. That's fantastic, Craig. I think you've really highlighted why the VCM has been receiving this criticism and why there is this perception of lack in quality. But we know at Climate Action Reserve, we are building the most transparent, high quality credits into the market. It's a piece of our work that we're proud of. And you've helped lead into this next question, which is, how do we build confidence back into carbon markets? That's a great question. I do think it begins with efforts like the ICBCM. Again, just so that the listeners understand, the ICBCM is trying to establish a threshold criteria for high integrity around the planet. That's why we are endorsing them. That's why we've applied. It's through efforts like that, that we'll get a, a level of recognition and a degree of confidence in the market that perhaps is lacking today. I think that's fundamentally important. I think there's another issue here that I wanted to just emphasize is that in the voluntary carbon market, everyone loves to use the term offsets and offsets have perhaps gotten a bad reputation, particularly in some compliance markets. But the fact of the matter is in the global voluntary carbon market, we're not talking about offsets. We are talking about carbon credits. Now, what's the distinction? In a compliance market, I'll use just California as an example. You have the high emitting facilities participating in the cap and trade program, and they're allowed the limited number of offsets to meet their compliance obligations. Currently it's 4% of their overall obligation. It's called an offset because it's an emission reduction beyond the, the programmatic boundaries of the cap and trade program. So whatever that offset activity, it's not included in the program. And it's, think of it as being beyond the boundary of the cap and trade program. Well, that boundary for the voluntary carbon market just happens to be the planet Earth. We're not talking about any actions beyond the boundaries of the planet. So it's not really an offset per se. And I know some uh, skeptics would push back and say, but it's still not getting companies to reduce their emissions. Uh, and that's a legitimate concern. However, I, having worked with many Fortune 1000 companies, any company that voluntarily is committed to reducing its emissions to taking on a net zero target or whatever their target might be is taking this seriously. And they're not going to spend money in an incorrect way, in a cost ineffective way. And I suspect that most CEOs, most boardrooms are going to demand that actions happen internally before externally. Now we can have a debate on that, but I just wanted to emphasize the point that those internal options are going to be on the table. And to many companies, they're not big emitters. The lion's share of their emissions are beyond the fence line of their operations. Why? Because they primarily use electricity, which obviously is generated beyond the fence line of their operations, but we're somewhere in their supply chain or elsewhere on the planet. So they're already encouraged to look elsewhere for investments in creating carbon credits. And frankly, they ought to be allowed to do that as cost effectively as possible. I draw that distinction because people I understand are going to continue to call them offsets, but we're not letting those companies off the hook, so to speak, that some skeptics might think when they're investing in carbon credits. Frankly, carbon credits represent nothing more than that investment beyond the fence line of a company's operations. By definition, that's an indirect activity, whether it's electricity or something else. And they're going to want to get claims for it. However, one thinks we should be accounting for that. That's an actionable, accreditable activity. And those of us who've been working in the traditional carbon credit world for many decades have been 
developing the appropriate guidance for identifying and quantifying those credits at a high level of integrity. We know how to do this. We have been doing it. Is it as widespread as it needs to be? No, it's not. But that's, again, as I said earlier, is the whole importance of efforts like the ICBCM is to scale up that market, to scale at that perception that there is quality to be had today in the market in many, many locations. What we need to do is flag for buyers out there where that quality can be found, and we need to scale it up. And I think everyone understands that. This is not a switch that you turn on overnight and suddenly have hundreds of millions of additional carbon credits. It has to be done in a very deliberate, high quality fashion. And that's what we're working on. Definitely, Craig. I think you've done a fantastic job in highlighting how we build this confidence in the market and doing this by bolstering collaboration across all of the different actors that are playing and being able to support these initiatives as we're expanding and scaling this market. So I definitely think that's key. And part of looking at high quality credits, there's a variety of different features and factors that we're looking at. So I want to ask and touch on additionality and ask you, why is additionality such a critical standard for high quality carbon credits? And how does Climate Action Reserve ensure additionality in our carbon projects? Great question. Additionality may be the most fundamental aspect of any carbon credit because what it simply means is that without the investment by the project developer and ultimately the purchaser of the carbon credit in that particular project activity, whatever it might be, that activity wouldn't have happened otherwise. Let me be clear. Carbon credits should not be issued to any activity that is already happening in the market, either because it's legally required or it's required by regulation, or for that matter, even if it's just common practice uh, on an everyday basis. Those are not types of activities that ought to be receiving carbon credits. The whole purpose of the carbon crediting mechanism is to incentivize emission reductions where they're not going to happen without that incentive embedded in the carbon credit. And that's really how we fundamentally get more cost-effective carbon reductions all over the planet. One other point on, on additionality, there's an ongoing discussion right now that if a country has listed something in their NDC, in their nationally determined commitment or contribution that countries are making at the UNFCCC process, that by definition, those activities are not open for carbon crediting. And I want to push back on that only to the extent that NDCs at the start represent nothing more than an aspiration that a country is expressing. It doesn't say they've taken any action whatsoever to make it required by law or required by regulation or any other approach. So until they get translated into a law or regulation, they're still open for potential carbon crediting activities. And that may be a nuance that might be lost on some listeners, but I did want to make that point because it's an ongoing debate. And let me be very clear. I would be delighted if every country would 100% implement their NDCs and made it happen. We need to do that right now. Every country right now and waste no further time about it. That needs to be the initial message. But to the extent that they're failing in that mission, the voluntary carbon market is ready, willing, and able to fill that gap. Thank you, Craig. Yes, we see additionality as such a critical factor for building our projects. And we only are going to be working on these projects if they are additional. So that's really important for us as a standard setter. And besides additionality, what are some other factors that are essential to upholding that a carbon credit is of high quality? And why are these factors so important to the Climate Action Reserve and the VCM? In addition to additionality, I would encourage any listeners to go to the ICBCM website and review their core carbon principles. But I want to highlight just a few that I think are critically important. And that would be a robust quantification, permanence, and sustainable development goals. Permanence means just what it sounds like. We need emission reductions and removals to have a permanent aspect to them. In other words, they can't disappear tomorrow. So one of the things that's very critical within the voluntary carbon market is 
given the activity that's under discussion, how long is it going to last? And there's a variety of steps that need to be taken to ensure that that permanence is there. And people differ on what the length of time is to achieve that permanence. The ICBCM has indicated that maybe 40 years is enough. Here at the Climate Action Reserve, we've always felt that a 100-year permanence requirement was fundamental for a simple reason. The accounting methods that everyone's using for doing their corporate inventories, for doing their national inventories, for doing project-level accounting, are the 100-year global warming potentials that are published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And our position has always been, if you're going to use values that represent 100 years' worth of environmental impact on the climate, you better deliver those benefits for 100 years. End of story. So from a permanent standpoint, that's critical. The other issue is robust quantification. What does that mean? Well, we need to make sure that we get the numbers right, or at least get them sufficiently right that we're conservatively recognize the amount of credits that should be awarded. What do I mean by conservative? Here at the Climate Action Reserve, we've always defined that as erring on the side of the environment. So we would prefer to under issue credits rather than over issue credits because that's fundamental confidence in the market. And there are just a number of different ways to build that into any methodology, but we do it regularly through our protocol development process to ensure that when there's a tough decision to be made, we are on the side that's going to lead to lower issuance of credits. Depending on the methodology, we may have something called a buffer pool. That's essentially an insurance mechanism where we set aside a block of credits in anticipation of problems arising in the future. So you have to make sure that you're quantifying the amount of credits that ultimately get issued in a proper and conservative manner. I also mentioned the sustainable development goals. The UN specifies 17 different goals, and it's important to know that a minimum of project is neutral on one of those goals or positively supporting it. And we're talking about goals that run the gamut from gender equality to labor rights, to avoiding child labor laws, to addressing other environmental issues, you know, what have you. So we set up our programs to be able to address those SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And that's an area, frankly, that's evolving. The level of detail that may be needed probably going to be different two years from now than it is today. We remain committed to making sure that our projects address those issues. And let me actually just mention one other factor that I think is fundamentally important to quality, and that's transparency in the whole process for bringing credits to market. It's been a hallmark of the Climate Action Reserve from day one, partly because we were a creation originally of the California legislature. But when we're developing a protocol or methodology, it's all in public. What I mean by that is that anybody can participate in the process. You can listen into the initial webinar. You can volunteer to be part of our technical working groups. You can volunteer to be part of just a general stakeholder community. You can participate in Every activity that we schedule, we record it all, we post it on our website. And programmatically, there's nobody who should be saying, I don't understand how you got here and what you did it, but what the end result was, because this is not a black box at all. Quite the contrary. Uh, we like to let the sun shine brightly on everything that we're doing. And it doesn't matter whether you're in favor or not of what's being discussed. We welcome well thought out contributions to the entire process. The same is arguably true of projects. We want any certainly affected stakeholder communities to be involved in the process. Just one example, we have over 300 forestry projects in Mexico. Virtually every one of them has a local Lajito. That is the local community, the local people participating in the process as the owners of the lands. So that's just one item right there that we think adds to the overall quality. Thank you so much, Craig. These factors like permanence and the sustainable development goals are essential assurances for high quality, but I'm super happy that you also touched on the importance of our processes being so transparent and open to the public and how we are always looking to and involving communities on the ground, which is also such an important piece of this. And Craig, as we are looking at the VCM, which again, it's always evolving, what does the future hold for the global voluntary carbon market? And what are you most excited about? 
I think the voluntary carbon market, frankly, is the solution to the climate crisis. I have not always felt that way. I've told people that the first COP I was at was COP3 in Kyoto back in 1997. And many of us led there believing that that was the beginning to the end of the climate crisis. Well, time has obviously proven us wrong, but I fundamentally think that the global COP process is failing us, global negotiations. I hope that turns around, but why do I say that? We're going into COP28 in Dubai in three weeks here, and we are still fundamentally negotiating how to get started. For example, back in 2009, there was a commitment by developed countries to provide initial seed capital of $100 billion a year into a climate green fund to the developing world to address the climate crisis. Fast forward to 2023, we're still not to that $100 billion level. And that, keep in mind, is a starting point, not the end result. Now, I hope that this whole process turns around, but it is going painstakingly slow. And those NDCs that I mentioned earlier are not being turned into actionable policies in way too many countries, including the United States and many other richer countries, major contributors to the problem. So that problem, it's disappointing how it's shaken out. Why do I say that the VCM could be the critical component of it? One of the things I've learned in 36 plus years of working on the climate crisis is how we've transformed from not knowing what our solutions were going to be 35 plus years ago to today when the solutions are staring us in the face. What we lack is the political will to invest in it. And again, to oversimplify a very complex problem, we know how to green electricity grids. We're seeing the emergence of electric transportation and all types of modes of transport. Through the use of carbon credits and other activities, we know how to get to the rest of it. Just the, dealing with the greening of the grid and greening of the transport sector solves about two thirds of the problem there. And we know how to go after in the rest of it. And again, do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that that's an easy pathway, but it is staring us in the face, but it's going to cost money. And frankly, who has the money? It's the private sector. So with the right incentives, with the right support, we could unleash that hundreds of billions of dollars in capital that's required because that's where the money is. And there's enormous economic opportunity to the climate crisis as well, because we're talking about fundamentally changing how humans supply the services that we all want. And that has to be done in a more sustainable way. So there's no question there's money to be made in doing that. And we want to incentivize that, but it has to provide the right incentives and not erect unnecessary barriers. And that's frankly, one of my concerns with where we're at today is that there's attempts to limit the role that voluntary markets can play in the crisis. And I'll just give a couple of examples. We're coming out of the, the VCMI, the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative. Traditional carbon credits have been relegated to what I call the end of the line in terms of options for a company. Why? Because through efforts like the Science-Based Target Initiative, companies, first of all, are being asked to address their scope one, two, and three emissions. Again, briefly, scope one emissions are direct emissions when you burn fossil fuels. Scope two is electricity use. Scope three is everything else. And if you look at the results, most companies, when they do that scope one, two, and three inventory, the lion's share of their emission responsibilities are in scope two and three. And companies being directed to the VCMI and SBTI to focus on what's often called their supply chain or insetting or value chain, whatever you want to call it. That's fine to the extent that companies feel like they have influence over that. And more importantly, feel like it's a cost-effective option. But right now, the guidance is that's where they need to focus. And if any company is going to invest in carbon credits, it's what's being referred to as beyond value chain mitigation. And surprisingly, while under VCMI, companies can get a label for investing in those credits, they don't count against their footprint. I refuse to believe that the most fundamental tool, the most well thought out tool that we've developed over the last decades for 
reducing emissions, that is voluntary carbon credits, are going to be relegated almost to the sidelines. That's just unacceptable. And it's what I think the guidance needs to revolve to is simply getting companies to unleash their capital. Frankly, right now, we're not seeing as much action in the BCM as people thought a few years ago. And the answer is pretty understandable. Why? Because that capital is frozen on the sidelines for fear the company is going to get criticized for doing the wrong thing. And that wrong thing is often investing in carbon credits, which some people just call greenwashing. It is not greenwashing. We know how to do high quality, high integrity credits. And more to the point, this climate crisis will not be solved without those credits. Or as I said simply before, there will be no climate justice without carbon credits. Because this is how Apple is going to flow to the global south. Companies have the money. They need to get off the sidelines. They need to start investing towards their targets. And most importantly, they need to be supported when they do so. This may seem like a very simple conclusion, but apparently it's not for most people. If you're asking companies to voluntarily commit to action on the climate crisis, and they follow the rules that are being established for groups like the ICBCM to ensure that they're investing in high quality credits, we all have to support them when those chicken little critics come out of the woodwork and want to say that it's greenwashing, they're not doing enough. You go into any corporate suite, approach any CEO anywhere on the planet, and you basically tell them, hey, Al, I got a plan for you. We're going to commit to addressing the climate crisis with our contributions by spending $10 million a year, and you're going to be rewarded with protesters outside our headquarters and maybe even at your home. What do you think their reaction is going to be? It's not what you're saying today. They said, next question, let's move on. And they're, they're not investing. And so until we're willing to back them up, and applaud them for the efforts that they're taking. Doesn't mean we have to be 100% satisfied with those efforts. This is a continuous improvement challenge for humanity. What we need to be doing is congratulate them and say, we did great here, here, and there, but next time this one other area wasn't the highest quality, let's work on getting it better. Applaud their actions, don't just criticize them because you're gonna get what we're receiving now, which is lack of action. And that's the last thing humanity needs right now. I think you said that so wonderfully, Craig, in that we need action now. And the voluntary carbon market is a fantastic tool in our climate toolbox to be able to address this crisis now as we see the solutions now. And you helped us understand what needs to be tackled to address this scale and integrity issues that the market is facing. And Craig, before we close today, which I thank you so much for your time and all of the insights that you've shared with us around the voluntary carbon market, I wanted to allow you to share any parting thoughts and comments that you may want to leave with the audience. Well, thanks, Lauren. I've enjoyed this. I want to follow up what I just said about the critics of investing in credits out there. When you look at any individual company or look at entire sectors, and this work done by the Carbon Disclosure Project that shows that when sectors have estimated their own emissions, the lion's share of their emissions are not within their own operations. They're beyond the fence line. And more importantly, as I said earlier, this investment will not flow to the global south, to the developing countries that need it to attain sustainability without very vibrant support from the BCM. And so those of you out there who are skeptical about that, and I know I've referred to some of those as chicken little critics, you cannot let perfection be the enemy of the good because you may have a different objective in mind, but the outcome is no different than what the client deniers are accomplishing. You're paralyzing action. And that is the last thing we can describe. We are, humanity is not doing enough to address this climate crisis. You will hear a lot of talk in the coming weeks about what do we need to do to hit a 1.5 degree or two degrees centigrade ceiling on global warming. And the sad reality is we've missed out those targets. We're already going to shoot past those, which doesn't mean that we don't do anything quite the contrary. We need to redouble our efforts and stop this runaway train that of the way we're affecting our planet Earth. So get in the game. And if you don't like how quality is being defined, 
work with the entire market to make it happen, work with companies to advise them on what's the right way to do it, but simply doping on them because you believe that credits don't count or shouldn't count, but then you have an alternative policy preference for how to address this climate crisis is not sufficient. It's not acceptable. We need all tools in our arsenal right now to address this crisis. I personally think, as I've already stated, that over the last few decades, the potential for the voluntary carbon market to make the biggest difference is staring us in the face, but it doesn't have to be the only one. So get in the game. This is a serious fight. It's a fight for the survival of all of us. Thank you, Craig. Yes, we encourage folks to get in the game, come learn, be a part of these conversations. And I would be remiss if I didn't share that we will be having our North American Carbon World Conference, which we'll be talking about all of these different topics that Craig has really highlighted for us today in San Francisco this upcoming March. So definitely be on the lookout for that. And Craig, thank you so much for leading the charge here at Climate Action Reserve and ensuring that we are building this high integrity in the market as an offset registry. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. It's been a pleasure.